Happy Sunday. I'm John Clifford, the lead pastor with Greenhouse Project. And we're so excited that you would join us in our journey through the book of Matthew and our ministry down here. So if you want to have, find out any more information about who we are and what we do, you can go to ghproject.org and find out everything about us. Um, next week, we have a community cleanup happening. We're putting a dumpster at the end of our block and we're using it as an opportunity to clean up junk that has been piled up in our neighborhood because of COVID. And it's an opportunity for people in our neighborhood to be able just to declutter their house. So we're gonna have a big dumpster. Uh, that's October 17th, meeting here at the greenhouse at 12 o'clock. You can go to our website and click under events and find out all of the information. So we at Greenhouse are passionate about leading people on a journey to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ and to teach people how to be renewed in urban spaces. And we want to be able to walk out that journey. So what we did is we bought a house and we live in a neighborhood where we choose to influence and to love our neighbors. And in that, we get to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we want to thank you for those that have taken time to volunteer, uh, to share with us um, stories and to tithe or donate into our ministry. So thank you so much. We can't do what we do here without your support and uh, everybody else that gathers. So let's get into our message today. Uh, and we'll start by reading Matthew chapter 8, verses 14 to 27. Now when Jesus had come unto Peter's house and saw his wife's mother lying sick with fever, so he touched her hand and left, and the fever left her. She arose and served them. When evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out all the spirits with a word, and healed all those that were sick. So it might be filled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Verse 18, And when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart and go to the other side. When a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then another of his disciples said to him, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And he said to him, Follow me and let the dead bury the dead. Now the disciples got into a boat and his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest, a storm, arose on the sea, so that a boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. When his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he rose and, abroke and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord. We praise you that you've given us your written word. God, that we can have a glimpse, just a glimpse of how you lived and how you interacted with God being in flesh over 2,000 years ago with a group of disciples. And we pray, God, through your word, through the movement of the Holy Spirit, through your truth and your righteousness, God, that you can show us how we're called to live and treat and serve everyone else we come in contact with. But God, we, we know it has to start with us and it has to start in our hearts. So wherever we're at today, maybe there's somebody that doesn't believe, maybe there's someone that does believe, God, wherever we're at, continue to examine our hearts, reveal to us who we are, especially in relationship with you. God, and then empower us to take this back out to everyone that's in need. Bless this day, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We here at Greenhouse are in the process of walking through the entire book of Matthew. And when we turn the page from the Sermon on the Mount, with his, which is Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7, we get into Matthew chapter 8 where we're at today. The Sermon on the Mount introduces people to the teachings of Jesus, leaving people amazed by his authority as stated in Matthew 729 he spoke as one with authority and, and the word says not like the scribes or the pharisees now we see jesus authority over the supernatural with a series of healings 
between chapter 8 and chapter 9, there's, there's, there, there's nine healings. And Matthew has them grouped together all in one spot for a purpose. Three miracles of healing uh, with excluded people. Three miracles of power. And then three miracles of restoration. All of these healings, the, the, these miracles are for a purpose. We see these healings reveal Jesus' Jesus's compassion in meeting the needs of despised and rejected people. And I think that's amazing, especially in today's society. We talk about outcasts and people that are out on the fringe, but yet we really don't bring them into us. And this is what Jesus is doing. He, Jesus is in the process of restoring natural order. In doing this, Jesus actually gets the attention and attracts many, many people to follow him. And then he also finds people that find fault and reject him. It says in the beginning that, that, that Jesus saw in Matthew chapter 18, 8, 18, when Jesus saw a great multitude about him. And this is the spot where we will pick up. All of this reveals Jesus' mission and purpose as it's highlighted in verse 17 where it says, He himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. God showed up on the scene to restore natural order. From the Jewish perspective, physical suffering and sin were always closely linked. But here we see Jesus from the role of the servant to fulfill God's mission. He's not acting on his own in any way. These miracles draw thousands and thousands of people to follow him. At one point, 5,000 people followed him after he fed them. Everyone, we have to understand this because it's important. Everyone comes to Jesus with different motives. Then and now. People followed him for stuff. People followed him because maybe he was a guru. And even today, people tend to look to Jesus or God as, as someone that can just help them get out of messes or provide and bless them in some type of way. As if God's only purpose is to make you comfortable or make me comfortable and rich, and he's not. See, when we take a step back, most of our lives are spent looking to fulfill a personal agenda or a personal idea of what we decided in our heart of what life should be, and then putting that into the kingdom of God. The same way that many came to Jesus during that time is the same way many people come to Jesus today. And yet Jesus loves us unconditionally. Unconditionally. And if anyone has kids, you've figured that out already. How easy it is to fall in love with this little ball of creature that grows up, and but yet at the same time having our world completely inconvenienced and becoming completely annoyed. Like, I'll do anything for my kids, but on the other side, they kind of drive you crazy, right? In this, you see in your children selfishness and self-centeredness. If you ever want to know sin is alive and well in this world, put two toddlers together and you can figure it out. As a parent, we can see what's in the best need of our children, not necessarily what they want. My, my, my little boy wants to grab everything off the table, but sometimes those things could be harmful for him and harmful if I lose it, right? So this is where we are in Matthew chapter 8. Many will come to him and call him Lord, Lord, but will never follow. Jesus, hey Jesus, um, so you're a cool leader and you said some cool stuff and you did some cool things. I like that, I believe, but I'm not sure if I actually want to do the things that Jesus did. I think today many people want to be associated with Jesus' name and not necessarily the actions that he took. Jesus is the one that sets the standard for what it means to follow them. This is what I mean by that. I have no say and no opinion when it comes to what it means to be a disciple. My job is to either follow or don't. Meaning Jesus himself set the standard for what discipleship is, what it means to be a follower of him. And this is where Matthew's gospel differs a little bit from Luke's and Mark's. Because right in the middle of these healings, Matthew shows that same Jesus that has authority over nature and demons also has authority over the lives of his disciples. Ultimate authority. Meaning the disciples didn't do anything on their own. They were led and they were taught 
and shown directly from Jesus how they were to live and they were to act. Jesus decided where they were going to go and what they were going to do, and he brought them along. Jesus determines what following him will involve, and therefore, if you're going to follow Jesus, it must be on his terms. According to, to Matthew chapter 8, following Jesus often challenges us to face areas of our life that we often avoid. And I don't know about you, I don't like this part. I really don't like this part. Now, on the other side, I do like this part, but nobody likes to address those secret areas in my life. We must be willing to face those areas of our life if we're actually willing to follow Jesus. And when it begins, we find out how he deals with disorder, fear, and chaos. Ultimately, Jesus is taking us where we do not want to go and where we will not go on our own. And here's a few things. Hey guys, you want to go touch a leopard? Um, to be a leper was the worst thing was worse than being a Gentile. It's the worst thing that could ever happen to a Jew. And Jesus is saying, hey guys, you want to go heal this person and touch them? Hey guys, you want to go heal a Roman centurion service servant? And so I was like, why would we want to heal the people that's persecuting us? It doesn't make any sense. And Jesus is ultimately going to say, and we'll talk about this next week, hey guys, you want to go to the Decapolis, the 10 cities? Um, Jesus, why would we want to go to where the doors of hell literally are? That's what they believed. It was the center for idol worship of the day. And Jesus would take them there. Ultimately, where Jesus is taking these guys is to a spot where he's saying, Hey guys, would you be martyred for my name's sake? And I'm sure now some guys would question, Why would we want to be killed for God? Jesus ultimately sets the standard. The challenges for a lot of us on our side, we're probably asking a question more like this. God, if you loved me, you probably wouldn't allow pain, heartache, sorrow, and sin into my life. Have you ever asked that question? God, if you loved me and you cared about me, you wouldn't allow these challenges to come upon me in any possible way. It's a real thing. Every once in a while, I'll see my son, he's trying to pull up and he's trying to stand, and he'll fall over. He'll hit his head. But ultimately, I know it's part of the process. I don't want him to hit his head, and it's not super hard. Don't look at me that way. But ultimately, I know this is going to be part of his good. If he doesn't keep pulling himself up and falling over, he won't know what it means to balance. He has to do it over and over and over again. There's going to be heartache and pain and growing in this world. It comes with it. What I'm asking myself today is that question of God, if you loved me, what if the questions I'm asking and the conclusions have been wrong from the beginning? See, we have this same thing going on here in Matthew chapter 8. Matthew shows us that the lifestyle of God was different from what we thought it would be. Meaning the Jews and many of us think that we know what God would say, what God would think, and what God would do. Then Jesus shows up and shakes the entire system, shakes it up. See, many of us don't know what it means to actually follow Jesus. And in the text we are looking at today, we'll see it in three different ways. By looking at personal chaos in the heart, by looking at natural chaos in the storm, and next week we'll get into this deeper, but looking at the supernatural chaos of the wild. And Jesus takes us to a journey into our hearts, into the storm, and into the wild. And our focus primarily today will be on the, the discussion and Jesus revealing the hearts of the followers of Jesus and addressing their personal chaos in their world. Matthew chapter 18 through 22 says this, And when Jesus saw a great multitude about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. When a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, and the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. 
It's always shocking when Jesus' word highlights a hidden area in our life. Two weeks ago, me, me, me and Emily met with a counselor to do uh, the Enneagram test, and, and we've done it in the past, and this was the first time we were going to do it together with a professional. And we took the test, and the results were what I thought it would be until we got with the counselor. And to be honest, I was shocked to find out that I wasn't the number that I thought I was, and I'm not going to tell you what it was. Uh, but I was also shocked to find out how emotional, insecure, defensive, and irritable I am. All right? Like, I'm like, wait a second, I paid for this, and now I'm shocked on what it's actually saying that I am. Like, I had no idea. See, Jesus' words actually awaken what we didn't know what was there. And that's what happens when we allow the gospel to to come into our heart. Jesus is calling us to realize what is in my human heart. And let's be very clear. In the middle of these healings, Jesus is showing what it really means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. We talk a lot about this at Greenhouse. Matter of fact, there's an all discipleship gathering and a training happening at our house this Tuesday. But we talk about discipleship as being unbroken fellowship with the Father. And that's what Jesus experienced. What happened here is we see Jesus highlights the difference between popular enthusiasm and fully devoted discipleship. There is no halfway. In other words, there's a big difference between the crowd and the church. The crowd looked for more stuff and the church actually looked to do the things that Jesus does. So following Jesus becomes more about obedience and following him and less about personal needs and comfort. And I think it's important that, that, that we talk about this for a minute. Following Jesus needs to be more about obedience to him and less about my personal needs and comfort. And in this text, we're going to see two types of people seeking God. We'll spend more time with the first one. See, the first one is a man showing up, making an announcement, a proclamation in front of a crowd. Could be someone looking for positions and titles and comfort, and it's called selfish, amb selfish ambition. There's a big warning about it. We'll talk about uh, that later in another message. But this person is probably the overpromiser, right? So we're from Philly. We do this. Um, the Eagles are playing today. They're going to dominate and they're going to win. Like every game they're going to win. They're going to go undefeated this year and they're going to bust everything open. Um, yeah, okay. I want that to happen. Believe me, I want that to happen, but that's probably not going to happen. I think in Philly, Philly we always overpromise. Yeah, dude, I'll definitely show up. I'll bring the best of everything, and I'll be there. We'll make this party the greatest event that it's ever going to happen. Man, we have the best steak sandwiches if you go to this place. Like, like we're always willing to overpromise, but the problem with that is we always underdeliver. See, people, a lot of us have excitement and passion, and, 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 and people even say, hey, listen, man, I want to volunteer. I want to show up for outreach. I'm going to be there, and then, like, two people show up. See, we have a scribe. And Jesus is on the shores of Galilee, and he says to the crowd, hey, listen, we're going to the other side. And that means something so deep, we're actually going to take that phrase and talk about it next week. But there's something interesting happening when a scribe comes up, not to question or, 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 or to have a disagreement, but to make a bold statement. And I believe this statement is purposely here for everyone to hear. He calls him teacher, and the scribes were well known to be teachers themselves. They wouldn't have attached themselves to, to someone else or to proclaim someone else has authority over them. They were already in authority in the Jewish law, and they were closely associated with the Pharisees, and they were extremely educated and were considered part of the scholarly class. These people, for, for lack of better words, had PhDs of the day and were doing their own research and had no need to sit themselves under another teacher. This man was closely tied to, 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 to he was closely loyal to the religious traditions of the day, and and, and for some reason decides to abandon those things because he sees something important in Jesus' teaching and the words and the, and, and the healings that he's doing. 
He knows something's different. But the greatest distance we ever talk about is the difference between the head and the heart. 12 inches from knowing something versus doing something. The scribes were not followers and were not follow an uneducated person in any way. Just calling him teacher would have been flattering to the disciples. It almost would have said, wow, guys, we're actually here. We showed up on the scene. We mean something. And he makes a boldly statement, wherever you go, I'll go. And I'm going to say this. Jesus is not impressed with personalities, with fame or fortune like we are. We get starstruck if we meet someone who's semi-famous. Even in the Christian world, somebody shows up that writes a book. We want to give them the best food and treat them the best and maybe give them the best seat and the best position. And Jesus isn't moved by any of those things. <clears throat> it might be easy to get caught up with an excitement of having a celebrity around, but to understand that a strong profession doesn't actually mean a strong commitment. A strong profession does not actually mean a strong commitment because talk is always different than actions. Many people get excitement about following God, maybe read all the right books and get a seminary degree and study scripture. All those things are important to do and we should do those things. But we fail to take into account the long-term game of walking with God for an eternity and it happens one day at a time in this world, maybe for 40, 60, 80 years, depending on when you come to Jesus. So Jesus isn't questioning the sincerity of the statement, but what he does is he gives the man, he gives the man demands that he himself lives under. <clears throat> the same demands that Jesus is living under, he passes on to the guy. It says, the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Did you get that? God himself comes to earth and has no tent, no pillow, no home, no shore house, no beach house, no car, no refrigerator, no food, no personal comfort whatsoever, no possessions. What Jesus is saying is that there's no personal comfort in following me. What? Yeah. There's no personal comfort in following me. As a matter of fact, Jesus told his disciples that they would be hated for his name's sake. Here reminded uh, that Jesus is referred to the Son of Man, a title used over 80 times in the gospel, and, 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 and it's the most common name for himself. It's actually a term of his humiliation, especially appropriate with the saying, nowhere to lay his head. Jesus, in Jesus' humiliation, he didn't even choose to have the basic comforts of life because he, he, he wasn't doing it to be cool. He was doing it to model something back to us. Ultimately, the scribe could have heard this. You may go home at night. The people that were healed went home at night. Even the sinners had the place to lay their head. But Jesus was going to spend his night under the stars, staring and praying alone with his father. We would see him spend time at Peter's house and with Lazarus, but never in his own home. What Jesus was sharing with the scribes and, and, and making a very plain and obvious was the same statement made with us today. Affirming words are easy to make if you don't know the true cost. Let's say that again. Affirming words are easy to make if you don't know the true cause. Many become attracted to Jesus for the things he did and the things he stood for. But it's all part of excitement and glamour. And there's a hope of personal benefit, such as being healed or, or being fed. People are quick to jump on the bandwagon when things are going well, but as soon as things become unpopular or, or the demands of sacrifice come and put pressure on us, people jump right away. The bandwagon, man, it's incredibly easy to get on and incredibly hard to get off. One Bible com commentator observed this, 
People see soldiers on a parade in fine uniforms or in pictures and videos and are eager to, eager to join, forgetting the exhausted, bloody marches, the graves, and the lifetime of pain that can come out of war. Jesus saw that this man was eager to declare his allegiance, but didn't know the cost of discipleship. The cost involves self-denial, sacrifice, sacrifice, and no doubt suffering. It's a very real question. Would you follow Jesus today if you had no home, no food, and no friends? See, even easy believism is a real thing. And, and, and we must believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. There's a step that everyone has to take into salvation. Do you believe Jesus was raised from your dead? Do you believe he took your penalty of sin? And that's where the beginning starts. But the rest is going in a long direction with steps of obedience. The scribe promised Jesus everything but yet could deliver nothing. And the next one is actually much different. The second man could have been known as one looking for personal riches. We would say this is the under-promiser, right? So we have the one guy that probably over-promises and makes a bold statement in front of anyone else, and this one is the under-promiser. Um, like he, he's probably the person that says, ah, <clears throat> I would like to do that, but why don't I wait to get my life in order first? Or some can say, why don't I wait till I get money and then I'll be able to do ministry. Verse 21 says, another disciple came to him saying, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus simply said, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. What? That's kind of harsh, Jesus. You know, I thought that you're supposed to be kind and a little bit different. This disciple wasn't part of the 12. There was a group of people that followed Jesus but they were like the fringe people. There was a group of women and a group of other people that would follow him. Maybe attach themselves to Jesus unofficially. Maybe a week, maybe a few weeks here, maybe a few months. But never endured the entire process. Like the scribe, this man thought his relationship with Jesus was all that it should be. He apparently had uh, enough of a relationship with Jesus that he was able to go and to present this message with him, which was, hey, hold on. Um, in our day, the phrase that let me go bury my father means some, something different than what it mean, meant back then. So if I said, hey, I need to go bury my father, it's a statement saying, hey, my dad's dead. We have to go do the funeral. I'll be back. You're like, cool, three days. We'll see you back here. No worries. But during that day, it meant something much different. See, we can look at this statement and say, wow, this is commendable. The guy wants to follow you, but you know, he has to take care of, of, of a sick, dying person and their family. The Jewish culture was much different. See, there was no embalming in the Jewish culture. And the family tradition would be to mourn 30 days after someone's death. But Jesus wasn't about to wait 30 days to, for this man to come back. He had business to do. He was about... His father's business. He left everything behind to go and to do this. And this is what Jesus was leading his people on today. The term bury my father could mean something much different in Eastern cultures. It wouldn't be uncommon for someone's dad who was sick to say, hey, listen, my, I have to go bury my father. And that could mean I have to go take over my family business and deal with the affairs of my dad because he's old in age. Meaning that person could stay old in age and not die for another 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years. But in order to get the inheritance, someone would have to fulfill all the duties that were required of him. Especially if you were the oldest son. Meaning it was your responsibility to go and run the family business, to take care of the direction of the family and the people around. Your job was to be there. And if you didn't mourn and if you didn't want to take care of the family business, you would get no inheritance, meaning this would personally affect your pocketbook. We see the personal chaos of someone's life who wants to over deliver and wants to be part of Jesus, but yet can't follow through. And now we have the personal chaos of 
What am I going to do if I don't have the comfort of the family finances? What am I going to do with the rest of my life? And to be honest, this disciple disappears without any further mention. I'm not sure what I would do, but what would you do if you had to turn away a lifetime of riches to follow Jesus? This second disciple wanted to be associated with Jesus with his name, but yet lived his life for personal prosper, prosperity and well-being. Jesus reply is saying, hey, let the dead bury the dead, bro. One can't follow Jesus if he still longs to live an old life. We must be able to look into our hearts and count the cost and see if I can wholeheartedly give myself to Jesus because the decision to follow Jesus is mostly difficult the most difficult decision that I'll ever make. The scripture says no one putting their hand to the plow and then looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. It's very clear that a commitment made to Jesus is total and unreserved or it's not a commitment at all. And let's not forget this same Jesus said this. He said, don't think I came to bring peace on earth. I didn't come to bring peace, but I came for a sword so I can set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother and a daughter-in-law against his mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. He who loves a father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves a son or a daughter is more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not pick up his cross and deny himself is not worthy of me of being my follower. Wow. There is a point that Jesus does want to unite everyone. But until that, there needs to be a clear division of who is following and who is not. And for the one that's following, most likely you will be hated for his namesake. And at some point, you have to draw the line of what it means to follow Jesus and count the cost. If a person allows anything to hold him back from a full allegiance to Christ, he's not worthy of being in the kingdom of God. And this is what Jesus is saying here so clearly. It's not about Christian service or about salvation because no one can actually get saved with strings attached. There's no strings attached when we give our heart completely over to Jesus and get saved. Bishop J.C. Riley said this, The saddest road to hell is one that runs under a pulpit, past the Bible, and through the middle of warnings and invitations. Both of these men that we just talked about wanted to conform into following Jesus. They wanted to change Jesus into what they needed instead of asking Jesus to turn them into what God wanted. What? Yeah. Many people come to Jesus looking to change Jesus into what we need, instead of asking Jesus to change us into what God wants. And that's the difference. Because this life is not going to be about perfection in this world. It's about perfection in the Savior. The daily walking things out and turn, turning our lives over to Him is where we need to be. We should be always asking this question, especially when it comes to our life, what is truth? Because I find I'm telling myself a narrative in my mind that life is this way and I need to do these things over here. And then when I look at God's word and get alone and the conviction of the Holy Spirit says, no, this is what God wants me to do and this is where I'm called to believe. And I think I know the hardest time to be a disciple of Jesus is when I have a commitment that I've faced to do something important over here, but I know Jesus is calling me to leave that behind and go over here. It's hard to be a disciple when I'm tired of working all day, 12, 13 hours, and I have to go home and take a shower and then go and leave and go to a group of guys maybe 20, 30 minutes away. When my life becomes inconvenience for the sake of the gospel or following Jesus or diving into a deep relationship with him, then I rethink my decisions. The word says, let God be true and let everyone else be a liar. Jesus explains that some people run from truth because truth actually exposes our sin. Do you know that? 
Truth exposes our sin. And Jesus said, the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. And after saying all this, Jesus got into a boat and then everyone followed. Verse 23 says this, now when he got into a boat, his disciples followed him. There you go. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea so that the boat was covered with waves, but he was asleep. When his disciples came and said and, and awoke him saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, why are you fearful? O you of little faith. Then he re rose and rebuked the winds in the sea and there was a great calm. So the men marveled saying, who can this be? that even the winds and the sea obey him. They marveled at Jesus. The natural chaos of the sea is very interesting. It's unstable. I'm one that loves the ocean. And I love the water. But man, when, when, when I look at this, I'm like, man, these guys were professional fishermen. And it's kind of funny because when I think of professional fishermen, I think of the show Deadliest Catch, when these people are out like in, in the Bering Strait in Alaska and the, the waves are 40, 50, sometimes 100 feet and they're looking to catch crab and it's called the deadliest job for a reason. I, I, I think these guys were feeling that same emotion right then and there. And I know that I always find out who I am in the midst of the storm when you lose all control and you have nothing to grasp. When, when you feel that your life is in complete danger and, and, and these men are led into this spot. But Jesus led them into this spot. Do you get it? He led them into this spot. He led them and was with them during the difficult times to model what it meant to follow him through a storm. These men were completely afraid of their lives. There was mass amounts of fear that came over them, even though the Savior of the world was with them. We must be willing and purposefully to come to the end of our lives in our control. And sometimes a storm is the only thing that reveals that. It's in this spot where Jesus can completely take control of our lives. He has the power to calm the sea and to raise the dead. He most certainly can be with us in the situations we go through. And my pastor always shares there's, that in life we're going into a storm, in a storm, or coming out of a storm. We're going into a trial, in a trial, or coming out of a trial. That seems to be the stages of life. Jesus wakes up, restores everything. He gives a glimpse of what life is like now, how God originally designed everything to be and what it's like to be in heaven with him. And Jesus reconciles all things unto himself for a purpose. Colossians 1.20 says, And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. And the healings and the miracles and discussions was all part of a purpose. The purpose here is to fulfill scripture, making Jesus' work true and proof that he is the Messiah. It's to glorify the Father because all works must glorify the Father and in this the Father glorifies the Son. It's also to restore natural order, to take what's happening in chaos and in the physical world, in the natural world, in our personal world, is to take that chaos and give us a glimpse of what life is like with unbroken fellowship. As a living testimony to other people, God uses our infirmities and our sickness as a testimony to broken people around the world. Tim Keller comments that we modern people think of miracles as the suspension of natural order, where Jesus meant them to restore the natural order. In verse 27, says, the disciples marveled. Wow. Do you still marvel about Jesus? It means to adore, to admire, to, to wander. Jesus being in all reminds us who he really is. 
We all adore something. And people who don't follow Christ adore Satan. Read Revelation 17, 8. When, when the beast is released, it says the people that don't follow God were in awe. They were in wonder about the beast. I, I, I just want to remember that Jesus got in the boat too. Don't forget this. Because I think we forget that Jesus not only plotted out the course of of life and ministry, but he also led them and he went with them. Jesus walks with us through every trial, every temptation, every storm, and every time he reveals another layer of our heart. We get to see the humanity of Jesus when he sleeps, when he eats, when he cries, yet he has command over life, death, sickness, words, and now the nature of and see. Each and every day, Jesus is unfolding who he really is to his disciples. The question I want to leave us with today is, can you see it? See, I can easily miss it if I'm not reading the word or spending time alone, digging deep and, and, and asking questions and getting alone time with God to pray and to seek him. If I'm not doing those things, I become angry, jaded, and frustrated. Can you see it? Here's a few questions for us for the road. One, are you allowing Jesus to reveal or challenge the hidden areas or agendas of your life? Do you allow Jesus to reveal or challenge the hidden areas or agendas of your life? the secret things. Two, am I fully committed to him or am I just doing lip service? We test that by the things we do. Am I sharing the gospel? Am I uh, open to accountability? Am I being disciplined by the scriptures? Do I serve with my time? Do I give? Like, there, there's a bunch of things we can look at. The question is, are you fully committed? Are you in a discipleship relationship? Are you out sharing with other people, inviting people into your world? And here's one I want to ask our groups to get into today. To reflect on a recent challenge or a recent storm or a recent temptation that came into your life and share how it affected you. And it's okay to be honest. It's okay to say, yo guys, this happened in my world and, 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 and this byproduct came out of it. Let's talk about that. Let's expose that and, and, and work on the root behind these challenges because if we're not willing to allow Jesus to expose the secret things in my heart, there's no way I can give myself fully over to him. And we don't have to be afraid of the chaos and the natural unorder in this world because Jesus is here to reconcile everything and we can share that back with the nest hurt and broken person. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word, for your truth, for your righteousness, and the work that you're doing here and around the world. God, allow us to use these verses to share with one other person how my life has been impacted by being a follower of Jesus. So God, we thank you today, and we praise you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you for being with us today. Uh, please go to our website, ghproject.org, to read more about our ministry and how to get involved with outreach events, volunteering, or giving. We're looking forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. God bless you. Have a great day.